The execution of Louis XVI, by means of the guillotine, a major event of the French Revolution, took place on 21 January 1793 at the Place de la Revolution, Revolution Square, formerly Place Louis XV, and renamed Place de la Concorde in 1795 in Paris. The National Convention had convicted the King the 17th of January 1793 in a near unanimous vote while no one voted not guilty. Several deputies abstained and condemned him to death by a simple majority. Topic: <laughs> Journey from the Temple Prison to the Place de la Révolution. Louis XVI awoke at five o'clock and after dressing with the aid of his valet Jean-Baptiste Clary, went to meet with the non-juring Irish priest Father Henry Essex Edgeworth de Ferment to make his confession. He heard his last Mass, served by Clary, and received communion. The Mass requisites were provided by special direction of the authorities. On Father Edgeworth's advice, Louis avoided a last farewell scene with his family. At seven o'clock he confided his last wishes to the priest. His royal seal was to go to the Dauphin and his wedding ring to the Queen. After receiving the priest's blessing, he went to meet Antoine Joseph Santerre, commander of the guard. A green carriage was waiting in the second court. He seated himself in it with the priest, with two militiamen sitting opposite them. The carriage left the temple at approximately nine o'clock. For more than an hour the carriage, preceded by drummers playing to drown out any support for the king and escorted by a cavalry troop with drawn sabers, made its way through Paris along a route lined with 80,000 men at arms and soldiers of the National Guard and sans culottes. In the neighborhood of the present Rue de Clary, the Baron de Batz, a supporter of the royal family who had financed the flight to Varennes, had summoned 300 royalists to enable the king's escape. Louis was to be hidden in a house in the Rue de Clary belonging to the Count of Marson. The Baron leapt forward calling, Follow me, my friends, let us save the king. But his associates had been denounced and only a few had been able to turn up. Three of them were killed, but de Batz managed to escape. At 10 o'clock, the carriage arrived at Place de la Révolution and proceeded to an area where a scaffold had been erected, in a space surrounded by guns and drums, and a crowd carrying pikes and bayonets. <laughs> <laughs> Execution After initially refusing to have his hands tied, Louis XVI relented when the executioner proposed to use his handkerchief instead of rope. After this his hair was cut and the collar of his shirt was removed. After being led upon the scaffold, Louis tried to give a speech but the noise of the drums made this difficult to understand. He was then laid on the bench, the collar closed over his neck and then the blade came down. According to reports the blade did not sever his neck but cut through the back of his skull and into his jaw. <laughs> Witness quotes. Henry Essex Edgeworth Edgeworth, Lewis's Irish confessor, wrote in his memoirs, The path leading to the scaffold was extremely rough and difficult to pass, the king was obliged to lean on my arm, and from the slowness with which he proceeded, I feared for a moment that his courage might fail, but what was my astonishment, when arrived at the last step, I felt that he suddenly let go my arm, and I saw him cross with a firm foot the breadth of the whole scaffold, silence, by his look alone, fifteen or twenty drums that were placed opposite to me, and in a voice so loud, that it must have been heard at the Pont Ternant, I heard him pronounce distinctly these memorable words, I die innocent of all the crimes laid to my charge, I pardon those who have occasioned my death, and I pray to God that the blood you are going to shed may never be visited on France. <laughs> Press of the day 13 February issue of the Thermometer du Jour Daily Thermometer, a moderate Republican newspaper, described the king as shouting, I am lost. Citing as its source the executioner, Charles Henri Sanson. Topic: <laughs> Charles Henri Sanson. Charles Henri Sanson responded to the story by offering his own version of events in a letter dated the 20th of February 1793. The account of Sanson states. 
Arriving at the foot of the guillotine, Louis XVI looked for a moment at the instruments of his execution and asked Sanson why the drums had stopped beating. He came forward to speak, but there were shouts to the executioners to get on with their work. As he was strapped down, he exclaimed, My people, I die innocent. Then, turning towards his executioners, Louis XVI declared, Gentlemen, I am innocent of everything of which I am accused. I hope that my blood may cement the good fortune of the French. The blade fell. It was 10.22 a.m. One of the assistants of Sanson showed the head of Louis XVI to the people, whereupon a huge cry of, Vive la nation! Vive la République! arose and an artillery salute rang out which reached the ears of the imprisoned royal family. In his letter, published along with its French mistakes in the thermometer of Thursday 21 February 1793, Sanson emphasizes that the king bore all this with a composure and a firmness which has surprised us all. I remain strongly convinced that he derived this firmness from the principles of the religion by which he seemed penetrated and persuaded as no other man. Henri Sanson In his Causeries, Alexander Dumas refers to a meeting circa 1830 with Henri Sanson, eldest son of Charles Henri Sanson, who had also been present at the execution. Henri Sanson was family appointed executioner of Paris from April 1793, and would later execute Marie Antoinette. Le Boucher Speaking to Victor Hugo in 1840, a man called Le Boucher, who had arrived in Paris from Borges in December 1792 and was present at the execution of Louis XVI, recalled vividly, Here are some unknown details. The executioners numbered four, two only performed the execution, the third stayed at the foot of the ladder, and the fourth was on the wagon which was to convey the king's body to the Madeleine Cemetery and which was waiting a few feet from the scaffold. The executioners wore breeches, coats in the French style as the Revolution had modified it, and three-cornered hats with enormous tricolor cockades. They executed the king with their hats on, and it was without taking his hat off that Samson, sick, seizing by the hair the severed head of Louis XVI, showed it to the people, and for a few moments let the blood from it trickle upon the scaffold. Louis <inaudible> Sébastien <inaudible> Mercier <inaudible> In Le Nouveau Paris, Mercier describes the execution of Louis XVI in these words. Is this really the same man that I see being jostled by four assistant executioners, forcibly undressed, his voice drowned out by the drums, trussed to a plank, still struggling, and receiving the heavy blade so badly that the cut does not go through his neck, but through the back of his head and his jaw, horribly? <laughs> Jacques de Molay. A popular but apocryphal legend associated with the execution states that as soon as the guillotine fell, an anonymous Freemason leapt on the scaffolding, plunged his hand into the blood, splashed drips of it onto the crown, and shouted, Jacques de Molay, tu es venge, usually translated as, Jacques de Molay, thou art avenged. De Molay died 1314, the last Grand Master of the Knights Templar, had reportedly cursed Louis's ancestor Philip the Fair, after the latter had sentenced him to burn at the stake based on false confessions. The story spread widely and the phrase remains in use today to indicate the triumph of reason and logic over religious superstition. <laughs> Burial in the Cemetery of the Madeleine The body of Louis XVI was immediately transported to the old Church of the Madeleine demolished in 1799, since the legislation in force forbade burial of his remains beside those of his father, the Dauphin Louis de France, at Sens. Two curates who had sworn fealty to the Revolution held a short memorial service at the church. One of them, de Moro, stated in evidence, Arriving at the cemetery, I called for silence. A detachment of gendarmes showed us the body. It was clothed in a white vest and grey silk breeches with matching stockings. We chanted vespers and the service for the dead. In pursuance of an executive order, the body lying in its open coffin was thrown onto a bed of quicklime at the bottom of the pit and covered by one of earth, the whole being firmly and thoroughly tamped down. 
Louis XVI's head was placed at his feet. On 21 January 1815 Louis XVI and his wife's remains were re-buried in the Basilica of Saint-Denis where in 1816 his brother, King Louis XVIII, had a funerary monument erected by Edme Gaulle. Today The area where Louis XVI and later the 16th of October 1793 Marie Antoinette were buried in the churchyard of Saint Mary Magdalene's is today the Square Louis XVI green space containing the classically self-effacing expiatory chapel completed in 1826 during the reign of Louis's youngest brother Charles X. The crypt altar stands above the exact spot where the remains of the royal couple were originally laid to rest. The chapel narrowly escaped destruction on politico-ideological grounds during the violently anti-clerical period at the beginning of the 20th century. Bibliography Necker, Anne-Louise Germain, Considerations on the Principal Events of the French Revolution 1818. Hugo, Victor, The Memoirs of Victor Hugo 1899. Thompson, J. M., English Witnesses of the French Revolution 1938. Paul and Pierrette Giraud de Corsac have written a number of works on Louis XVI, including Louis XVI, Roy Martyr Taqui Louis XVI, Un Visage Retrouvé OEIL Notes <inaudible> <inaudible> <inaudible>